We hope you enjoy listening to this weekly podcast from Lifeline Church. You can find out more and discover our other podcasts by searching for Lifeline Church, visiting lifelinechurch.co.uk or by taking a look at our YouTube channel, Lifeline Church Dagenham. We're up to episode 14. Um, So it's going to be a little bit taxing today um, because we're going to do a bit of a word study in Greek, which um, is a bit painful. You go kind of... There's quite a few logical steps that we've got to, got to go through, but there is a drama thrown in, so swings and roundabouts, really. Okay, right, so a lot of Acts 11 is Peter describing what happened in Acts 10, so we're not going to go through all of that again because Jeremy did that, so we're just going to top and tail it today. So here's, here's the first bit. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, so then, even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Okay. So what kind of stood out for me is this, is the idea of, if God has changed the rules, you've got to stick with, with God. And so I was thinking about the children of Israel. Their lives were constantly packing up, following the clouds, Setting down, waiting, moving, packing up again. That was constantly what they were doing. And we see in Numbers 9, it says, Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israel, Israelites set out. Wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites camped. At the Lord's command, the Israel's, Israelites set out, and at his command, they encamped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in the camp. So... Everything they were doing was depending on what was the move that God was making. If he was staying, they stayed. If he was moving, they were moving. And what we see in this first passage was the the people in the church were complaining to Peter, hey, you went and ate with, you went into Cornelius' house. You went to be with an uncircumcised guy. that's, That's against the rules. So Peter explained all of his dream, explained the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on, on Cornelius and his house. And he said, and then Peter said, who was I to think I could stand in God's way? If this is what God's up to, this is what he's up to. And at that point, it said they, they had no further objections. Like, okay, I guess, I guess everything's changed. God's changed how it works. We stick with that. And so... Sometimes in life, we've got to get with where God's at. Sometimes God's moved on from a position or a tradition that we've been party to in the past. Sometimes God's saying, no, we're going to stay here. And you're, there's something in you that wants to move on. You want to change the subject. And I think in culture, we, we, are, we grow up within a culture that is constantly moving ahead or moving behind what God is up to. And there can be this phrase, I don't know if you've heard this, get on the right side of history, which means get on the culture's side of the argument. But if you look back over history, culture's been on the right or the wrong side the whole way through. So trying to do what everyone else is doing is not a fair, is not a safe way of staying on the right side of what God's doing. Because sometimes culture wants to move when God's saying, no, this, this is a point that I stay on. Sometimes we want to we stay and God said, no, no, we, we've moved on. Things have changed now. You'll find that with it when it comes to all kinds of, kinds of issues. There will always be some new scientific research or some kind of latest philosophy that looks to question or undermine or contradict what God's word says. If you look back over all of the history, you see that we go, history and, and cultures move all around the place and God's word remains consistent. What is he seeing? We want to stick with that. And so where 
people will say, you want to get on the right side of history. I'd prefer to say, we want to get on the right side of his story, because he gets to decide. He picks what it is. I want to be where he's at, not what seems to be popular at this moment. So a little question for you to consider. Has God moved on from a position that you're trying to stick to? Maybe God said, it's time for that relationship to end. Or maybe God's saying, I think it's time to, to move out into a new area. And you're saying, no, I'm not, I'm not ready for that. Or, well, this is what you said back to me in, in 1999. God's saying, no, it's, it's time to move. The, the cloud is moving. Or maybe you're trying to move on from a point where God is sticking to. And you're thinking, oh, I just, I just need this to change. I've just got to make this little bit of little move now. Here's my opportunity to do something. And God's saying, no, wait. I want you to wait on this thing. So maybe as I'm saying that, the Holy Spirit might be poking you with something. Lydia, let's get to the bit that I want to spend more time on now. Now those who have been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, um, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Okay, so... Here we've got the gospel now being purposely directed to those without a Jewish heritage, to the, to the Greeks over in Antioch. And there is another revival breaking out because the cloud has moved. God is doing something different at, at this point in time. And so it says there, a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So what does the church do? What do the leaders do? They, they send Barnabas. He's like the special forces that are sent in. So Barnabas, we remember Barnabas from uh, back in Acts 4. And so it said there, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So what we see here for Barnabas was when he arrived, he saw what grace what the grace of God had done, and he was glad. And he encouraged them. So, when a renewal is happening, reinforcements are sent. We've seen that a couple times already. And the person that's sent is an encourager, not a revivalist, not a healer, an encourager. And what did he do? He saw and he was glad. He saw what God was up to. He saw where the cloud was going, and it delighted him. I want to be like that. I want to perceive what God is up to and be excited about it. I want to see what God's up to in your life and be excited about it. I want to see what God's up to in my workplace or my, my kids' school and be excited about it. I don't want to just go through the motions of living life. If God is up to something, I want to be part of it. I want to be on his, at the right side of his story. It says in, the, actually the psalm that uh, Mark was reading, 118, verse 23, the Lord has done it, God has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. I want that reaction. I want to be so excited what God's up to. What's my daddy doing? I want to come and play. I want to be part of that with him. And then what he does, he, he encourages. So let's have a little look about this whole idea of the ministry of encouragement. So this is where we get into a little bit of a word study. So the word encourage 
is parakaleo. Kaleo. Parakaleo. And it's made of two words, which is one to be close beside and one to call or to direct or to point. Now, it's translated in lots of different ways. So whenever you find a word that is translated in lots of different English ways, it means that the Greek word is too rich for the English language. So every time the, the translators put it down, they try to think, oh, which word best fits at this point? So it could be beseech, implore, beg, appeal, call upon, plead, comfort, exalt. That's a lot of different words to try and get across that one word. And then when it's in the noun form, we see it as helper, comforter, advocate. And the sense of this, this word is it's about offering up evidence that stands up in God's court. I hope you're getting a sense of the richness of what it means by encouragement. It's a really important role. The leaders of the church thought it was such an important role that that's who they sent to bring, uh, to bring what God wanted for, for that church in Antioch. It's also one that's incredibly difficult to get right. Encouragement is a really tricky thing. Because often we get kind of muddled between sympathy or truth. People tend to kind of lean to one or to the other. And we all know what it's like to be counseled by one or the other. So you can have almost too sympathetic. The poor you, who then jump down into the hole with you and say, oh gosh, it is dark and miserable down here. Yeah, no, you're a right to feel this bad. It's horrible. Oh gosh, what a mess you're in. Very sympathetic. Possibly got some emotional intelligence with that, but <coughs> somewhat it leaves you kind of hopeless. We also know what it's like when you have those that come with a very uh, strong truth element. Yeah, no, nah, you shouldn't have done that. This is what you should do. This is what you should know. You can sometimes feel a little bit beaten up by those people. Don't feel that they really understand you. We've all been counselled by people that are one or the other, and in fact, probably, we have been one or the other in some way. I know there's times where I've done that kind of overly sympathetic, oh man, if I was in your situation, I'd feel the same. In fact, I'd be even worse. Or you get that kind of sentimental, oh, well, at least, look on the bright side. There's silver lining in the clouds. There's a comedian, John, uh, Josh Widdicombe, he said that he just had a breakup, and people around him said, well, it's better to have loved than to, and to have lost than to never have loved. So we don't say that about a mobile phone. If I lose my phone, we don't say, well, at least you had a mobile phone. <laughs> Sometimes we get kind of on the other side, we become a bit judgmental. Well, really, it's your fault. If, if you'd followed the advice that you were given, you should have done better. Oh, well, it's so simple. Just do this, 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 and this. We can also get into manipulation, where if you're not going to take my advice, if you're not going to do what I say, then I'm going to back away from you. Trying to cause that person to act the way that we want. Or we get into shaming. Yeah. Shouldn't have done it like that, should you? It's kind of, it's kind of your problem, isn't it? We can weaponize our disappointment. I'm really, I really wish you'd done something different in, there, in that situation. Or we can make it about, if they just do what I told them to do, suddenly it's about you and your ideas that are the saviour. Sometimes we speak when we should be silent. We're silent when we should speak. We're too in someone's face when they need space or we withdraw when they need someone with them. It's a really difficult job to get right. So where do you tend to fall on the spectrum? Let's have a little bit of a explore. How did Barnabas 
managed to become the encourager that was recognized like that. So we see that he was a, man, he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's follow that link. Okay, so full of the Holy Spirit, does that give us a little bit of a clue? How does, how does, how does Jesus describe the Holy Spirit? So in John 14, 26, Jesus said, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. So we see the Holy Spirit is a link, and that there is the noun of parakleo. So the same words for encourager is advocate. The Holy Spirit is the encourager. So when I realize I don't have what I need to live the way that God calls me to live within me, I need someone that is greater than me to come and be within me and empower me. I need the ultimate encourager, Paracleo, to come be with me. Because you see, he manages to master sympathy and truth. And I will pray that I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may be with you forever. So the comforter, the sympathy, and forever, forever with us. And when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. It's both. See, if you think the words were to come alongside and to call out. So when Arthur used to love watching aeroplanes in the sky when he was a kid, if I just said, look, Arthur, there's there's one over there, he'd look at the end of my finger. I had to come down to his eye level. I had to come beside him so I could see from his perspective, see from his angle. And from that point, I could then call out and say, look, there it is. And then he could follow and see what I could see. And that's what Barnabas did. He encouraged them all to remain true with all their hearts. Truth and sympathy, both there. And we all need the soil of the encourager to grow into who God's called us to be. We need someone that's not too cowardly, that they're not willing to speak the truth to us, but not too impatient that they too quickly give us advice. We need the humility of an encourager, a person that really listens, that by the end of talking to an encourager, you actually feel lighter and more hopeful. You're more assured that there's a truth beyond what you're currently feeling. So let's look around this this paracleo a little bit more. So... We've seen this this scripture. I will ask the Father and he will send you another advocate. He will help you and be with you forever. Okay, so another advocate. Wait a second. So that means that the Holy Spirit is the second advocate. So, okay, who who was the first? Well, in 1 John 2, verse 1, we see who that one is. John's writing to the church. He says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But everyone, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So the second advocate is the Holy Spirit. The first advocate is Jesus. Jesus speaks to God for you. The Holy Spirit, the second advert, speaks to you for you. They have two different roles here. The idea of that is an advocate. We understand kind of advocates from all the kind of the the law dramas that we've, we've seen. And so the idea of this is how they used to do law. It was before the throne. You'd come before the throne and you would make your case to the judge, to the king. Now, today, 
It looks a little bit more like this. This is how we would see an advocate working for us. This is all pretty dense, okay? I understand that. So we've got a drama now. So if my drama people can come up, which hopefully will help you understand a little bit more of the role of the first advocate. That's for me to say right now, please stand for the honorable judge. You may take your seats. <laughs> we are here to witness the proceeding of righteousness against Mr. Ryan Rowe. Mr. Rowe, you stand accused against being before the throne room of God without authorization. How do you plea? Um, guilty. Not guilty. The persecution, please present your case. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I would like to call my first witness, please, to the stand, Mr. Samuel Goodspeed. Mr. Samuel, please state your rank for the court. I'm a lieutenant in the Angelic Guard. Ah, oh, lieutenant. You pour coffee for the king then, do you? No, no, it's a very respectable position. Ah. Uh, it's a great responsibility. Why is that? Well, I, I get to stand in the presence of God. I, I hear the singing. I, I get to gaze upon his majesty. I, I ensure that no impurity enters the holy throne room. Well, describe for us then, Mr. Goodspeed, um, the events that you witnessed on the night in question. Well, it was the morning, about 9.25. I left my post for about five minutes. I was led to deal with a commotion. When I returned, I saw that the door to the throne room was, was left ajar. Upon investigation, I entered, and that was when I saw the defendant. And are you positive that it was, in fact, Mr. Rowe that you saw on that night? I'm positive. And where exactly was Mr. Rowe? Oh, he was before the throne. Before the throne of God? Before the throne of God? Yep. Thank you, I have no further questions. <laughs> Your Honour, I would like to call my second witness to the stand, Miss Smith. So, Ms. Smith, um, describe for us the nature of your relationship with the defendant, please. Well, I guess you could say it was a romantic relationship. Um, we went for walks in the park, uh, went for picnics. He was, um, he was very warm and friendly to begin with. Lovely. And, and when did this change? Well, as soon as he got lucky. <gasps> <laughs> and how exactly did this change your relationship with Mr. Rowe? Oh, uh, no more walks, no picnics, no phone calls, no warmth, nothing. Just nothing. And how did this make you feel? Worthless. Absolutely worthless. And so, describe for us your reaction when you heard the charges against Mr. Rowe, namely, being before the throne of God. Well, at first I laughed. I couldn't believe it. What right does he have to be there after what he's done to me, and I'm sure to many others? Thank you. No further questions. Your Honour, I have one final witness that I would like to call the defendant himself, Mr. Rowe. Please take your place. <clears throat> Mr. Rowe, do you consider the testimony of the Honourable Mr. Goodspeed to be accurate? Yes. And do you consider the description of your relationship by Mrs. Smith to be more or less correct? Uh, yes, I, I It suppose. was a closed question, Mr. Rowe. Yes or no would suffice? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, in that case, I would like to know what you have done between the ending of your relationship with Mrs. Smith and your decision to embark on a venture which 
ended up somehow before the throne room of God Almighty to make yourself worthy? Uh, but, well, I've, I've, I've tried to apologize to Miss Smith uh, multiple times. I've, I've chosen not to be with another girl in the same way. Uh, I've, I've actually been changing how I've been thinking about women in general. Is that it? Is that it? Some, some feeble, I'm sorry, an attempt to, to think differently, to refrain from other relationships. Mr. Rowe, does that not strike you as a little bit pathetic? You dare to go before the throne room of God Almighty. Do you consider yourself clean? I'm trying, okay? It's, it's difficult. Do you consider yourself sanctified? Like I said, I'm trying. Speak up, Mr. Rowe. The court can't hear you. It's difficult. Do you consider yourself worthy to be in the presence of God? No! No! Thank you, Mr. Rowe. You may take your seat. Well, Your Honour, we have heard from a credible witness that Mr. Rowe was, in fact, before the throne of God on the night in question. We have heard from Mrs. Smith and from the defendant's own lips that he did nothing to make himself worthy to be in that place. And so, as your law states which I'm sure you're familiar with. My recommendation is that the punishment he deserves is nothing other than death. I rest my case. Defence, please present your case. <clears throat> your Honour, as the prosecution has stated, sin is punishable by death, and only through death can one enter God's presence. So how could a holy, just God permit Mr. Rowe to stand before him? It might seem impossible. However, a legal precedent was set when man first sinned. After Adam and Eve disobeyed God, he covered them, covered their shame with the skin of an innocent lamb. Isaiah later foretold of another lamb who would break every barrier of sin, granting all access to God's presence. I present Exhibit A, Isaiah's prophecy of this lamb. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and by his wounds we are healed. Your Honour, I submit Exhibit B. I am that lamb. I was pierced for his sins, crushed for his mistreatment of Miss Smith, removing the barrier between him and you. By my wounds, he is healed. Your Honour, I have taken all the sin committed by this man. He is no longer guilty of anything because you accepted my death as payment for all his sin. All his wrongdoings have been buried. A just God will not demand two payments for one debt. The prosecution, or anyone else for that matter, has no business trying to dig it up. But he could Therefore, his own lips. there is no reason for us to be in this courtroom today. There is no case to be heard. It has been tried, ruled upon, and it is now buried. This man is truly innocent. He has full authorization to be in your presence. By the blood that I shed, your honour, the defence rests. Well, after hearing both sides of the argument, it is clear that Mr. Rowe was before the throne room without authority. But in the light that the punishment was in fact truly paid. The law was fulfilled. 
And I am completely sacri- uh, satisfied with this sacrifice. I declare this man innocent. Jesus stands in your place and he is talking to the judgment seat. He's talking to the court. And he says, my people, those that have believed in me, have sinned. Your law says death. Here's my blood. I have paid their debt. It would be unjust to demand two payments for one debt. Therefore, your law demands acquittal. Jesus doesn't stand there asking for mercy. He's standing there asking for justice. It says in Hebrews 4, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. He came beside us. He came as a human. He got down onto our level. And yet he could point to something, point to what he's done. Hebrews 7, 25 says, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives and intercedes for them. Always stands in the gap. So that's what the first parakleo did. Therefore, the second one, the work of the Holy Spirit, is to keep pointing us back to what happened in that courtroom. Our defense. Our acquittal. The Holy Spirit is constantly saying to us, look what he achieved. Look at the cross and the empty tomb. Because of that, everything is now different. Look at what he's done for you. Look at his love. Look at how righteous you are now. You can come before the throne with boldness. Why are you upset? Why do you fear criticism, loss of power? Ground your identity in him. Your circumstances that you face are not the greatest truth. What happened in that courtroom is a greater truth. So, the empty cross, the empty tomb, therefore what? What today? It's not just a historical fact. It has an echoing significance for our day, today, tomorrow, this week. How do we become people that live in the good of what happened in that courtroom? Imagine I've got fear of desertion or rejection. It would cause me to put myself into unhealthy relationships. It would cause me to hold back speaking truth. It would cause me to cower away from things. But in the light of what the first advocate has done, I can live completely differently today because I know that he who didn't desert me then will not desert me now. Because I know that before the only court that matters, I have acquittal, I have his approval. Maybe you're haunted by past shame, things that you've done or others have done to you. What did he say? It's all dealt with. He has dealt with it. It's dead and buried. He's not. 
Maybe it's that fear of failure. Maybe it's, if I, if I get made redundant, what's going to happen? How am I going to pay my mortgage? And, and you just get into this panic and this fear spiral. Why a second. The same God who has loved me to the bitter end is the same God that's looking after me today. I can live in the reality of what he has done today. I don't have to get into a fear and anxiety. So, God, you're going to find other options. You always have. You always will. Tim Keller tells this story of um, this, uh, this preacher many years back who was called with the rest of the family to the deathbed of, of the, the grandma. And they're all gathered round, round her bed, and they think that she's asleep. And um, they're just talking, and they're saying, what a hard life she's had. She had two husbands die on her. She's been widowed twice. And look, she's barely got two pennies to rub together. Poor lady, poor lady. And like that, she opened her eyes, and she said, who calls me poor? I am rich, and I will stand before him as bold as a lion. That is someone that sees their present circumstance in the context of an empty cross and an empty grave. I want to live my daily life like that. Who calls me poor? Because I will stand before him as bold as a lion. What is it for you? Think of a situation that you've recently faced, or maybe you're going to face this week. How could the truth of the cross and the empty tomb change your approach? I want to be a minister of encouragement. I want to be like Barnabas. I want to be the person that's sent in when God's up to something and supercharge what's already going on like Barnabas did. But my ability to encourage is wholly dependent on myself being encouraged. I can only give out of the overflow of what's being put into me. Because if, if I don't live in the reality of what the encourager is saying to me, I'm in danger of giving platitudes. I'm in danger of leaning to my own tendencies when it comes to sympathy or truth. It says in 2 Corinthians 1, 30, uh, 3 to 4, the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. <clears throat> to be any use to you, I've got to know this for myself. I've got to be someone that sees my circumstances in the context of that courtroom, in, that, in the context of an empty cross and an empty grave. Before the throne. And you might be saying, I want the truth of that to affect my everyday. I want it to affect my today and my tomorrow and my week. I want to live in the reality of an empty cross and an empty grave on a daily basis. And this song is so rich, and it was, I'd written that sketch to try and unpack this, this song, because I have a strong and a perfect plea. Because that great high priest has opened the way for me. He stood in heaven, and he stands in heaven. Nothing no tongue can bid me thence depart. Nothing can take me away. Nothing can block me. And I can see him there, that perfect, spotless lamb that came and died in my place. He's made me one with God, and my life is hidden with Christ on high. And Satan, he can tempt me, and he can try and remind me 
of all that is gone. But when, when I look up and I see him there who's made an end of all my sin, I'm counted free. So let's use this song as a sign of God, make that real for me. I don't want to just know it in my head. I don't want it just to be a historical fact. I want the reality of that to touch down. So just, just as uh, John G's leading us, let me just pray. Holy Spirit, encourager, advocate, come and do what you do. Cause the reality of an empty tomb and an empty cross. Put our circumstances into context. Lord, let us have a fresh revelation of an acquitted court that we actually can can boldly approach the throne of God. Lord, as we take this song, work Holy Spirit in us, please. Cause us to see and to feel this once again. What we've heard today is a very, very powerful declaration, dramatic representation about not only what God has done, but the power of what he has done. This presents a wonderful moment if you've never ever come to a place of recognizing this great advocate, this Christ that has stood in that place, that has presented all that was needed to make you right with God. What a great moment in time to say yes, to say yes. I want to recognize and accept and submit to this advocate, this Christ who has made me clean before God that I can actually come and submit to him. To actually stand and say, yes, I'm receiving as I submit to Christ, I have an advocate. Just at this time of responding to God, I feel there's something else. You've already submitted your life to Christ. You've already recognized this advocate. But somehow, at this point in your time, at time, this point in your life, it's like you're almost at the point of saying, what's the point? Or giving up or I just cannot see the difference. I cannot see the breakthrough. That point of, of, of desperation. And as a demonstration, as a confession, that instead of listening to those things which, not that they're not true, but there is a greater truth. You say, Lord, I just come to you. I come to you with my despair, my disappointment, my difficulty, my almost feeling of what's the point. And I want you to join these others and just come as a declaration, as a standing, and say, I am going to trust in what the advocate, Jesus Christ himself, has done. Tempts me to despair and tell.
Thank you for listening to this podcast by Lifeline Church. We hope this message has been an encouragement to you. We are a relational church who live to demonstrate God's love to one another and our surrounding community in real and practical ways. We believe that this love can restore our families, our friendships, our communities and our nation. We'd love to connect further with you, so please visit our website, lifelinechurch.co.uk or interact with us on Facebook at lifeline.church.uk.